So number one on this list of ten. Number one is the concept of tawbah. Of the ways we cause Jahannam to be averted away. And of the ways we cause our sins to be forgiven is the concept of tawbah. And tawbah is an action of the heart. Repentance is a spiritual frame of mind. It is an internal act. And it means that we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a sin distances us from Allah. A sin puts distance between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does tawbah do? Tawbah literally means to return to. Taba yatubu means to come back to. So tawbah is to come back to Allah after the sin has been done. And tawbah is desired. Not only is it desired, it is wajib. It is obligatory. Tawbah is obligatory on each and every Muslim every single day of his or her life. And the blessings of tawbah are many. And I have given multiple khutbahs and every single scholar and every single lecture has talked about the importance of tawbah. And tawbah is the most effective mechanism for having our sins forgiven. There is nothing more powerful to avert Jahannam than the concept of tawbah. And what makes it even more powerful that no sin can withstand tawbah. Tawbah forgives every sin. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah can forgive all sins. But how? Wa anibu ila rabbikum. Wa aslimu lahu. Turn to your Lord. Submit to Him through the concept of tawbah. So tawbah forgives all sins. That makes it powerful. And what especially makes it powerful, dear brothers and sisters, is that its acceptance is guaranteed for the one who is sincere. The one who is sincere, the acceptance is guaranteed. No one can come between the sinner and Allah's mercy if the sinner practices tawbah. There is nothing that can avert tawbah being accepted. And therefore tawbah is powerful because it is wajib, because it is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it forgives all sins, and because the one who practices it and perfects it is guaranteed forgiveness. So when these are the stakes, then how can we not take advantage of tawbah? And in fact, some of our scholars have said that the concept of tawbah is one of the wisdoms why Allah created us. Think about this. When the angels asked, why would you create an inferior species? Why would you create a species that is bloodthirsty, killing, going to war? Why would you do that? We are sinless. We don't commit any sins. We are perfect. We praise you constantly, day and night. We don't sleep. We don't get tired. We never forget. Why would you do this? And Allah says, I know what you do not know. In the a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. And some of our mufassirun have remarked that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to manifest His merciful side as well. The fact that He forgives, the fact that He accepts the repentance of the sinner and the angels do not sin and the angels do not ask for forgiveness and the angels do not need tawbah. So who needs tawbah? We need tawbah. And that is why our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laid the foundations when he said that I repent to Allah every single day. Every single day. This is part of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So number one is tawbah. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us, At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kamal la dhamba lah. The one who repents from tawbah, the, the, the one who practices tawbah, repents to Allah, it is as if he has never committed the sin in the first place. The one who does tawbah from the sin, it is as if he has never committed the sin. So number one out of ten. How does one avert the fire of Jahannam and the punishment of Jahannam? Tawbah. Number two is related to it. It is linked with it, but it is different. It is linked, but it is different. And that is istighfar. Istighfar. Istighfar is the verbal act of tawbah. We said tawbah. How did I define tawbah? Tawbah is an action of what? I said it is an action of the heart, the qalb. Istighfar is the tawbah that is manifested on the tongue. 
So the difference between istighfar and tawbah, and the two of them mutalaziman, they necessitate one another. Each one needs the other, but they are yet separate. Each one needs the other, but they are separate. Tawbah is a state of the heart. It is a psychological frame of mind. Uh, and istighfar is manifesting that tawbah upon the tongue. And that is by requesting Allah to forgive you. And that is done by many ways. And the most common is to say astaghfirullah. But there are other ways as well. Any verbal request to Allah to forgive the sin. So tawbah is of the heart. And it is manifested inside. And that is why when our Prophet wanted to describe tawbah, he gave a psychological state. What is the description of tawbah in the hadith? An-nadamu tawbah. This is a hadith, two words. An-nadamu tawbah. An-nadam is to feel guilty. An-nadam is regret. So tawbah is regret. Tawbah is in the qalb. Tawbah is internal. Istighfar is external. And it is the tongue petitioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is to say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Astaghfirullah. I have committed a sin, O oh Allah, forgive me. Ya Ghaffar, irfirni. Ya Rahman, irhamni. Ya Tawwab, tub alayya. This is istighfar. Even when you say tawbah and you say, Ya Tawwab, tub alayya. This is in fact istighfar. Because the tongue is what does istighfar. And our Prophet said, hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, that, Wallahi inni la atubu ila Allah wa astaghfirullah fi kulli yawm akthar min mi'ata marra. Every single day, I repent to Allah and I say astaghfirullah. So notice, tawbah and istighfar, they are different but they are linked. Inni la atubu wa astaghfir. I do tawbah and I say istighfar. Every day, at least a hundred times. So if this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then where do I stand? Where do you stand? So, of the ten ways, number two now, we should make it a habit, inculcate into our lifestyle. Every day, every night, we should make it a habit to keep on uttering, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. The famous hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said, there was a man who committed a sin, and he raised his hands up to Allah and he said, Ya Rabb, adhnabtu dhanban faghfirli. Oh my Rabb, I have committed a sin, forgive me. So Allah forgives him. Then he commits the sin again or another sin. And he raises his hands again and he says, Ya Rabb, adhnabtu dhanban faghfirli. So Allah says, I have forgiven him. Then he does it a third and a fourth and a fifth time. And he keeps on saying the same thing. Ya Rabb, adhnabtu dhanban faghfirli. And Allah does not get tired of forgiving. As we said, some of our scholars have said, this is why Allah has created us to forgive us. Allah does not love the sin, but Allah loves the repentance of the sinner. Allah does not love the sin, but Allah loves the repentance of the sinner. So when the sinner says, Ya Rabbi, adhnabtu dhanban faghfirli, for the tenth time, Allah doesn't get tired. What did our Prophet ﷺ say? Allah says to the angels, He calls them and He says, I am calling you to witness, to testify that I have forgiven this habitual sinner slave of mine. He's always committing sins. I have forgiven him. Why? Because he recognizes that he has a Lord whom he has transgressed against, but who forgives sins. So because the servant recognizes who Allah is, and he recognizes how sinful he is, and he recognizes my only hope is istighfar, my only hope is Allah's rahmah. So because of that, Allah has forgiven him. So the second of the ten points, constant istighfar, constantly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, what else will avert us from Jahannam? What else will save us and prevent our good deeds from harm, or our evil deeds, excuse me, from harming us? What will be the mechanism to protect us from the consequences of our evil deeds? Number three, good deeds. Good deeds. Our good deeds expiate our evil deeds. Our good deeds dissolve, dissipate our evil deeds. Once a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he was in a very penitent state, very sorry state. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed a major sin. I have committed, I've done an evil deed. I have seduced a woman and I kissed her. Kissed a woman. He didn't go beyond this. He kissed her. Now in the Sharia, ah, the kissing does not have the had penalty. There's nothing the Prophet ﷺ can do in the terms of the court of law. This is not something that's going to be punished for in the court of law. So the Prophet ﷺ said nothing to him. Then the time for salah came and they prayed. And the man went away thinking that there was nothing he can do to get his sin forgiven. So the man called the Prophet ﷺ back. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ called the man back and he said, Oh so and so, 
didn't you come to the masjid and pray with us? And he said, yes, I did. Don't you know that Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Doing good deeds forgives evil deeds, causes evil deeds to go away. In other words, you have repented, you are clearly guilty, you have come in a sorry state, you are making istighfar to Allah, now you have walked to the masjid, you have prayed with us, this good deed will forgive your evil deed. So hasanat yudhibna sayyat. And we all know when we do wudu, the evil deeds fall from our hands. When we pray, our Prophet ﷺ said, it is like the one who washes five times a day, he takes a bath, he takes a shower. Do you think anything will be left on him? They said no. So they said, this is the example of the one who prays five times a day. No sin is left on him. Ramadan to one Ramadan, and Ramadan is coming in a few weeks. Ramadan to one Ramadan forgives everything in between. The Hajj causes you to come back as if your mother has given birth to you, as clean, as pure as a newborn baby. And on and on and on. Sadaqa forgives, uh, brings about Allah's forgiveness. Sadaqa dissolves Allah's anger. Sadaqa causes Allah's anger to disappear. So every good deed causes some of your evil, some of your harm to dissipate away. So that's number three. Number four, the dua and istighfar of other believers for you. What else causes forgiveness? What else saves you from Jahannam? When other people make dua for you, especially by name, but even generic dua, because all believers are commanded by Allah to seek forgiveness for all other believers. A part of our culture, our Islamic culture, is we ask Allah, Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, wal muslimina wal muslimat, al ahya'i minhum wal amwat. We ask Allah's forgiveness for all the believers. So, our hope is when we go away, our hope is when we're gone, the people who ask Allah's forgiveness for all believers, some of it, inshallah, will come to us as well. We cannot rely on that. But it is a hope, and it is one of the ways of kafara, one of the ways of protection of Jahannam. And especially a dua by name. Especially a dua by name. And that is why we are encouraged to seek forgiveness for others. Because when we do it for others, then inshallah when we are gone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause people to do it for us as well. And how stingy we are, brothers and sisters, that we don't even want to raise our hands up to Allah and ask Allah to bless other people, ask Allah to protect other people, ask Allah to forgive other people. Don't we know that when we do it, an angel will say, Ameen, and may you get the same as what you have asked your brother and sister. Don't we know that as we do unto others, so shall be done unto us, kama tadinu tudan. As we seek forgiveness for others, Allah will create people that will seek forgiveness for us. So point number four, Dua and istighfar from the other believers. Point number five. What else forgives the sins and protects us from Jahannam? Point number five. The calamities and the trials and tribulations and the pain and the suffering and the anguish and the grief that every one of us faces throughout our lives. Of the mercy of Allah, and He did not have to do this, but of the mercy of Allah, is that every physical or emotional pain that we suffer, if we have faith in Allah, and we have sabr and yaqeen, that pain will dissolve our sins as well. As our Prophet ﷺ said, no servant of Allah is afflicted with ham or gham, nasab or ta'ab, no suffering, nor anguish, nor anxiety, because wallahi, sometimes an intellectual pain is more painful than a physical pain. In fact, that is usually the case. We would rather have a one-time pain than the pain of debt, the pain of family, the pain of suffering. That's more difficult. And our Prophet ﷺ said, never is an abd afflicted with any anxiety, any pain, any anguish, any grief, except that Allah will make that pain and anxiety and grief a kafara for his sins. And that is why, brothers and sisters, when a believer is tested with pain and suffering, in fact, the believer at one level embraces it. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody likes pain. 
But when the believer is tested, one side of him appreciates the testing. And he or she understands, Allah is testing me so that my sins may be forgiven and I may come on the day of judgment with no sins. So this is point number five, the calamities and distresses and physical pains and mental anguish that we suffer in this world. Point number six, and this is one that is not desirable. We don't want it. In fact, we seek refuge of Allah against it. But there will be people that this point and the next point will actually act as a factor to save them from Jahannam. So it is better than Jahannam, even though it is not good. Point number six is the adab of the Qabr. And we seek Allah's refuge. We don't want adab al-Qabr. We want tawbah. We want istighfar. We understand life is going to be difficult. We don't want it, but we understand it's a part of life. But adab al-Qabr, no. We do not want it. And a few months ago, I gave a khutbah on adab al-Qabr. And you can listen to that whole khutbah, which is online. We went into detail about the types of adab al-Qabr and how to protect and whatnot. But there will be people, and we do not want to be amongst them. They are major sinners. They deserve Jahannam. But Allah will punish them in the graves so that they do not go to Jahannam.